Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're ready to go. We're going to get started. Um, so thank you for joining us, both to everyone who's here in person and joining the webinar. I'm Emily Coughlin. I'm the Collections Manager here at the History Center. And today we are going to talk about the life and legacy of Albin Palaszczuk. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Palaszczuk Museum. It's in Winter Park. I somewhere. Oh, sorry, this might do. It has to be like, is that better? Yeah. Okay, I'll just stay really close. All right. So, let's get started. So, Alvin Palaszczuk was born in Frenchdot Podrad Hostum now part of the Czech Republic, on February 14, 1879. He was the seventh of eight children born to Joseph and Petronella Palaszczuk. And as a small child, he had a propensity for drawing and carving and really anything art related. Um, he also, as you can see from the picture, um, was really into, he was a pretty short man, so he joined what they called a Sokol, which is essentially a gymnasium, but not your normal gym, it was gymnastics. So he did this to build up his physical strength because he was only about an inch taller than me, he was like 5'4". He was a small but powerful man. <laughs> so the first piece that we're going to talk about this is Alvin's nativity. This was done about 1895, and he was about 15 years old when he finished this. As a child, his family owned an inn in their town, and when he didn't want to do his chores, or when he finished his chores, he would take pieces of wood, he would squirrel away under a large table in the corner, and he would carve these figures. Um, he was always trying to hide from his mother because, of course, she had more for him to do. Um, so if you look at this piece, you can see all the pieces are hand carved, and he actually made his own paints using charcoal, rust, berries, anything he could get his hands on to paint them. And most of the figures are actually portraits of people that he saw on a daily basis in his town. My favorite part of this, if you look into the manger, there's a cow. Her name is Babushka. She was the Palashik family cow and Alvin's favorite. They had a great bond. So of course she had to be included in his nativity. I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. The central figures of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, those are the only pieces to this that are not original. When he got a little bit older, his brother had it in his church, and somebody stole Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So he had to redo these. He actually was a professor, we'll get into this. Um, and he made it a class project that everyone had to carve a Jesus, Mary, and Joseph triad because he was that upset and if he had to redo it, all of his students were doing it with him. Um, but something that's great about this is it's, if you ever visit Kalashik, it's in a huge tabletop case and the museum is pretty sure that he built the case himself and the thatch that's included in the nativity is all from French dot. So it's as original as it can be. And um, according to the museum, it's the oldest piece in their collection. Now moving on a little bit, um, as Alvin got older, we'll get into it, but he was an immigrant. And obviously he lived in Florida. He came to the US at some point. And um, in 1939, he was invited to speak at the National Institute of Immigrant Welfare. He was given an award because of all of the good that he had done for the United States. And he wrote in his speech a quote that at this point was kind of looking back at his life. But if you think about it earlier in his life, it really set the course for what he achieved. Um, this is a quote that uh, is used quite a bit. And it's in the heart of Czechoslovakia, a piece of rock broke off from the Moravian Mountains. Later, this crude stone was transported to the land of the free, the United States of America. The block of stone was myself. Through the opportunities that this country gave me, I started to carve out my destiny to free myself from the rock so that I might be useful. So playing off of that, in 1901, Alvin decided to come to the United States. He had been around Czechoslovakia a bit, done some apprenticeships, run away from everyone, and every time he would come home, the whole town was upset, his mother was upset, 
So finally, when his brothers came back from the United States for Christmas, he decided he wanted to return to the U.S. with them. Both of them were priests in Minnesota, and it was uh, Emil and Robert. So in 1901, Albin and his brother Robert boarded the USS Colombo, and they came to New York City. And he is quoted as saying in his biography, there's a part where he's coming past the Statue of Liberty, and he is just in awe, and he can't believe that he's finally made it, and he's finally going to have a chance to do exactly what he wants to do. So he comes to the U.S. and he goes to La Crosse, Wisconsin to get a job at the Hackner Altar Factory. And during this time, he decides that he's going to go visit his brother Emil. And they go and visit the Lewis and Clark Exposition in St. Louis. So this is when Palaszczuk runs into the work of world-renowned sculptor Charles Grafley. And Grafley, at the time, was a professor at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Those of us from Pennsylvania call it PAFA, so that's what I mean when I say PAFA. Um, and he was completely inspired to see that this could be a career for him and he could do what he loves every day. So these are some photos of his time at PAFA. Um, you can see him, he's in the front in the group photo working on a portrait. Um, he's working on a bust in the lower photo, and then up in the corner, they did a classes on live sculpting. So they would bring in models, and all of the students would have to sculpt a bust within a certain amount of time. Um, they did this multiple times, and Grafley actually made it a competition. Whoever won, got, he would make a bust of them. So Alvin won, and he was absolutely elated that Charles Grafley was going to make a plaster bust of him. And it's on display at the museum. If you, everyone should go see it, it's beautiful. Um, but he kept it that entire time because it meant that much to him from a sculptor that he respected so much. So during his time at PAFA, he would go back and forth in the summers. He'd work over the summer and then he'd come back and he had enough money to pay his tuition. So he would go back to the Hackner Altar Factory in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And when it comes to sculpture making, there's something called pointing. So a lot of sculptors who carve wood, carve stone, they see a block of stone, they have an idea for it, and they take a pencil and they kind of draw out their idea on one of the faces of the stone. Then they use something called a point machine and it drills these little holes in the stone so as they're carving, they know exactly where they are. It's like, okay, this point right here, that's part of the arm, that's the elbow. And Albin never had to do that. He was like Michelangelo in that way where he would look at a block of stone or a block of wood and he saw what was inside it and he was just trying to free it. Um, so this is one that he did for the altar factory. This is about 1906, this is the Archangel and you can see him standing below it and standing next to it working on it. And he goes back to school, he tells Grafley about it, and Grafley says, there's no way you did that. You pointed that. You can't sculpt without pointing, no one can. Well, Alvin got a hold of these pictures and showed them to Grafley, and he was shocked that Alvin could do it without any machinery, just a hammer and chisel. So obviously, he, was, he um, had a lot of esteem with his professor, uh, so much so that they became friends and Grafley would call him Palashi. Um, and m moving into 1907, he had another art project and he decided to basically create himself. Um, so this is man carving his own destiny. This is considered Albin's signature piece. He did about 53 variations of it throughout his career and throughout his lifetime. Um, the original was done in 1907 when he was at PAFA. Um, and we have some photos here of it. Uh, this is what the sculpture would start as. And then he did smaller versions. He did larger versions. Um, and he would work in clay. And then he would use what's called the lost wax casting process to have things cast in bronze. So just like we said in the beginning, his speech from 1939, this is what he's referring to. He was carving himself out of rock. 
so that he could fulfill his dreams. And this sculpture is the personification of that. Also, when he was quite young, in 1909, he did a piece that was called Eternal Moment. And um, it was quite a stir at PAFA. It was also a good year for him because it was the year that Albin became a US citizen. He loved this country so much that he wanted to become a citizen, so he would never have to leave. Um, but one of the quotes from it, upon its unveiling, the Philadelphia Le Public Ledger wrote that Eternal Moment was a remarkable group which has caused the eyes of the world of art to be focused upon Albin Palaszczuk and which has brought the Bohemian sculptor fame in a day, was executed in a cellar at 740 Catherine Street in this city. And when reporters would go to him, he would say, life is only a moment, but love is eternal. And that's what this sculpture stands for. Um, you can see in the far picture, he's working on it. Um, that was a life-size group. This one right here was done about 1954. Um, he carved it out of marble, and it's much smaller. So during his time at PAFA, obviously, he did a lot of wonderful pieces, worked really hard, so hard that in 1910, he was awarded the Prix de Rome Fellowship, which at the time was the greatest art honor a student could receive. It granted him three years of study at the American Academy in Rome. He would have access to all the museums, he could travel, and he could really learn about classical sculpture, which is what he wanted to do. This piece in particular was done in 1911. So Francis Davis Millet, Millet was an American muralist, a painter. He was well regarded throughout the US. And at the time, he was serving as the secretary to the American Academy in Rome. And Albin had floated the idea of asking him to sit for a bust. And all the other students said, go for it. He's not going to do it. He said no to everybody else. So Albin asks. And to his surprise, Millet agrees. So they would meet during lunch breaks. Um, Millet would pose, Albin would sculpt, and after a few weeks, this was the final product. When it was unveiled, when Palaszczuk finally let him see it, he said, it is remarkable and it will do you much good. Well, unfortunately, in 1912, those words rang true. Millet was aboard the, US, the RMS Titanic on April 15, 1912 and perished in the sinking. There's quotes from some of the survivors saying that the last time they saw him, he was standing on the deck waving goodbye to all the people he helped put in lifeboats. So, and he was just a joyous, jolly, sweet, sweet man who loved what he did. He loved his students, um, but his words rang true that it would do Albin much good. After the news got out of the tragedy, all Albin could think about was losing a friend but all institutions could think about was getting their hands on this bust. So it brought him a lot of publicity that he was not prepared for, and nine copies were commissioned of the Millet bust. There's obviously one at the Palaszczuk Museum, there's one at the American Academy in Rome, PAFA has one, there's one in New York. Um, they're kind of all over the place, but honestly, it's one of my favorites just because He's just a sweet man. His eyes are so kind. Um, he's actually a little bit different. This one you can see, it goes down to his chest and it's curved. The other ones, their base is kind of like an L. So this is the original. When he came back from Rome, he moved into a little place called McDougal Alley. If anyone's familiar with art history, McDougal Alley became a huge, huge place for artists. So in the early teens, it became what I like to call an unlikely artist community. The stables that were along the alley were being turned into artist studios and homes. So among him were Daniel Chester French, uh, James Earl Fraser, his wife Laura Garden Fraser, and Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Her original studio was on McDougal Alley, so he rubbed elbows with some pretty prominent people. If you know Daniel Chester French, he's the man behind the Lincoln Memorial. 
Um, so, of course, he befriended as many as he could. Unfortunately, I've never found a record of him befriending Gertrude. I hope he did. Um, but we have a photo of him standing outside of his studio and another one with um, the neighbor's children playing out in the alley. But during this time, he was just working, getting commissions, just trying to establish himself and establish his studio. Another fun fact about this location, right around the corner was 8 West 8th Street, which was the original home of the Whitney Museum. That's where Gertrude started her museum, and it is now the New York Studio School. But you can go visit. You can go visit Gertrude's studio. She did this gorgeous sculptured fireplace that goes all the way up the wall. During this time, one of the sculptures that Alvin did was called Aspiration. And you can see it's a female figure. She's seated. She has pipes in her hand. And she's holding a cherub above her and kissing it on the lips. And the inspiration was that she was sucking the music, the inspiration out of the cherub to make her music. But the real reason that this piece exists is because Alvin got into an argument with another sculptor. And the other sculptor said, it doesn't matter what the back of the piece looks like. All that matters is that the front is pretty. Alvin disagreed. He believed that it should be viewed in the round and that all the sides of it should be gorgeous. So this was his response. He created aspiration, and you can see the front and the back, that she is perfectly sculpted on all sides. The attention to detail that he gave every side was perfect. And he was in his studio a year later working on some commissions, and he gets a letter from, the Phil from PAFA telling him that he has won the George D. Widener Gold Memorial Medal. This, of course, came with a cash prize, but it also came with a medal, solid gold. And this medal was actually created in memory of George D. Widener. Uh, his family were, they were very prominent in Philadelphia. They were financiers, they were horse breeders. And of course, George, like Millet, perished in the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. So his family created this award. They were huge funders of the arts. So they created this award to essentially encourage young artists, and it was for the gorgeous pieces that they were creating. Alvin was the third person to ever receive this award. And they actually don't award it anymore. They stopped in the 60s. From there, his life just kept getting better. In 1916, he was working in his studio in New York when he received a letter inviting him to be the head of the sculpture department at the Art Institute of Chicago. So of course, he dropped everything, packed up, and moved to Chicago. Um, at the time, he was 37 years old, and he worked there for almost 30 years. Well, over 30 years, I should say. Um, and we have some photos of him working in his studio. Um, this one right here where he's leaning on his piano. He always had a piano. He was a huge lover of music. He loved to sing. Um, and he loved to get people together to sing and play instruments, even right before his death. He was always doing that in his home. When he got to Chicago, the Art Institute decided, OK, well, we want to welcome him. What can we do? So they decided to take one of his sculptures and put it on the front steps. The one they chose was the sewer. Now you can see it's a sculpture of a nude man. And at the time, 1916 Chicago, that didn't go over very well. People from the school loved it because it's the perfect example of classical sculpture, the muscle tone, the movements. It looks like he could just walk away. Well, the public was not about this. So of course, People complained. They wanted censor. They're, they were censoring things at the time. It was 1916. It was considered indecent. So all of these people were upset. And all it did was backfire. Droves of people were coming to see the sewer because they wanted to see for themselves why everyone was so upset. So thankfully, the Art Institute stood its ground and said, we are not moving the sculpture. It is classical art. It's staying where it is. 
they gave up eventually and it now lives at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. But as I said, you can see the muscle tone and it looks like he's just gonna walk away. The photo over here, that's from uh, when he was installed on the front steps from the back and then these two photos are from the Palashik Museum. I should also say before I go to the next slide, that the sower was done in 1911 when Albin was in Rome. And in 1913, he sent it to Paris, to the Paris Salon, where it won honorable mention. And even the Paris Salon honorable mention is a huge deal. So during his time at the Art Institute, again, he made friends such as Alphonse Mucha, and who was another Czech artist, and Charles Hawthorne. So Charles Hawthorne was a prominent American painter, and um, he was at the Art Institute teaching a class. He was doing a master class, doing critiques, and of course, because he played the cello, he met Albin. So he would play his cello, Albin would sing, and they just became fast friends. So one day, Albin decides, I'm going to do a bust of Hawthorne. So while he's working on this bust, Hawthorne decides, well, I will repay you by doing a portrait of you working on the bust. <laughs> so, of course, artists still do this. They do work, they trade work. I mean, I've met few artists that have paid for most of the paintings in their homes. Um, but Hawthorne did this painting. It was called I Do, it was called I Do Amici. Amici and they decided, all right, 1917, let's submit them in the annual show because the Art Institute of Chicago did an annual exhibition. So they submit them and the Art Institute says, we want to purchase both of these. Well, Hawthorne had already promised the portrait to Alvin. So the agreement was, Alvin had another bust cast of Hawthorne. So the Art Institute got one, Hawthorne got one and Hawthorne said he would only sell the painting on the condition that he would get another chance to paint Albin. So a year later in 1918, Albin decided to take a break. He went to Provincetown, Massachusetts to visit the Hawthorne family. And while there, he decided to make a bust of Hawthorne's son, Joe. Unfortunately, there's no record of what happened to the actual bust. Last seen, I believe it was in the Hawthorne possession of a relative. But this is the portrait that Hawthorne painted of Albin working on the bust of his son, Joe. Now, one of the great things about this painting, besides its beauty, is that if you look at the fireplace, this is an older photo of the Palashik studio. If you look at the fireplace, it's stone and it fits perfectly around that frame. Albin designed his fireplace for that painting nothing else can be hung there, nothing. It would have to be the exact dimensions. So that's where it always stays, exactly where he wanted it above his fireplace. Also, while he was in Chicago, after he met Hawthorne and Mucha, um, he got a commission to create the Theodore Thomas Memorial. Theodore Thomas was um, the founder of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and this was how they were going to honor him. So Alvin got the commission and decided, okay, we want to make a woman. We want her to be feminine, but not super feminine. She still should be strong. She should have a musical instrument. So spirit of music is what was created. Now something really, really cool about her, the wood sketch that's at the Palashik Museum, there are not marks, but like cuts in her. So a lot of times large bronzes, not a lot of times, all the time, large bronzes have to be cut into smaller pieces so that they can be cast and then they get welded back together. So this is just a theory, I don't know for sure. My theory is that especially around the breastplate, it kind of looks like a sweetheart cut, you can't really see it in the picture, um, but it looks almost like she's a puzzle, like that he, designed her, again, this is just my theory. It's been my theory for a couple of years, but um, that maybe he designed her so that she would come apart into the pieces she would be cut in to be cast. I don't know if that's true, it's just a thought. But 
there's definitely some marks on her body where it looks like she fits together. In the center, we have a photo of what she looked like in clay once she was modeled and ready to go. And then this photo is the final product. And um, you can see she has that very classical Grecian um, drapery, and she's holding a lyre, and she has a crown. Um, the wooden sketch was one of four that he created because he couldn't make up his mind. He, again, was friends with Daniel Chester French, so he decided to send pictures to French. And it became French's favorite piece that Albin ever did. And he told him that. He said it was remarkable. Um, but she is still in Chicago. You can still go visit her. She's been moved a few times, but they keep track of her. Another piece he did while he was in Chicago was Forest Idol. Alvin had a fascination with myths, mythology. He also had a fascination with Native Americans and their culture. Um, but he really leaned into woodland creatures. So Forest Idol depicts a nymph holding a baby deer, and you can see her mother, well, the baby's mother, is looking up anxiously at the nymph who took her baby. Um, and she, again, like Spirit of Music, she has the classical drapery, but there's a couple different versions here, and they all are different enough. Like man carving, he would run with a concept, but he would change it up every time, so it was never exactly the same. Um, so the original was done in 1924, and it wasn't very big. It was only about 24 inches tall, and he always wanted to make a larger one. Well, he was on a special assignment teaching at the American Academy in Rome in the 30s, and he gets a request from Anna Hyatt Huntington and her husband, Archer Milton, to create a larger version of Forest Idol because they were going to open Brook Green Gardens and they needed sculpture to fill America's first sculpture garden that was open to the public. And Forest Idol was the first piece that they purchased. So you can see in the far picture, that's the sketch that was done in 1930. That's him with it before it was cast in bronze. And there's a huge difference. She has Princess Leia buns. That's not probably the best way to say that, but um, her hair is braided and wrapped around her ears in a circle. Um, he looks very stoic with his finished product. Um, but this piece did go on to Brook Green Gardens, and you can still see it there today. And then the piece in the center is a later version that Albin created of Forest Idol. Um, and this one, it looks similar to the 1924 version, but the face is actually a portrait of his second wife, Emily. So every time he did Forest Idol, he changed her up just a little bit. One of the pieces that is considered his greatest accomplishment is actually Victorious Christ. Albin was a devout Roman Catholic, and um, he was asked in 1939 by Bishop Hunkler of St. Cecilia's Cathedral in Omaha, Nebraska to create a crucifix for them. They were redoing their altar, and they commissioned Albin to make a crucifix. Well, Albin, being a devout Roman Catholic, agreed, and he created a seven-foot sculpture on a 15-foot cross. And you can see it's gilded bronze, so the entire thing is coated in 24 karat gold. And the photo on the far side is the piece in clay. And then these two photos are of the one that's at the Palashik Museum right now. And the cool thing about Victorious Christ is most crucifix scenes that you see, Jesus is looking down. He's always sad and, you know, it's a horrible thing that's happening. So he's looking down. Albin's is unique in the sense that he's looking up. So he depicted the moment that Christ looked up and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And it's interesting, there's a cute story. He couldn't figure out how to sculpt Christ. He knew he wanted it to be a universal figure. He didn't want to model it after a specific person. So he was in his workshop 
trying to think of what to do, and a man knocked on his door of his studio and said, I'm looking for work, do you have anything? Alvin lets him in, they talk, and um, he says, all right, come back tomorrow, I have some things you can do. The man leaves, never comes back. But the next day, Alvin was struck by inspiration and finished Victorious Christ almost immediately. So he always thought that that man was an angel that came to give him the inspiration to create the sculpture. Um, there is another funny thing that he did. He was very picky, which, I mean, you should be if this is what you're doing. The sculpture was cast. It was on its way to Omaha, and he thought, I don't like the arms. So it gets to Omaha. The foundry comes in. They pack it back up, they take it back, they cut off the arms, and they put the new ones that Alvin sculpted on it. Um, so it's still there at St. Cecilia's. You can go see it, and it is beautiful at their altar. Another large piece that he did, he was commissioned for quite a few monuments. So as we said, Alvin was Czech. Um, and the first democratically elected leader of Czechoslovakia was Thomas Masaryk. And he greatly respected Masaryk because of the empowerment he gave to the people and just he was their protector and he wanted the best for everyone. So when he passed away, a group in Chicago said, let's do a monument. So they talked to Palashik. He had a million things going on. He said, all right, all right, let me see what I can do. So he starts thinking and he thinks, all right, we'll do a bust or a full sculpture. It'll just be a statue of Masaryk. Right around this time, the city of Chicago said, no, no, we have enough statues. You need to make something else. No more statues. We need something better. So that gave Alvin the opportunity to create Thomas Masaryk as what in Czech mythology is a Blonic Knight. So in their folklore, the Blahnik Knights lived up on Mount Blahnik. They were medieval warriors. And any time the people below were being oppressed or invaded, they would come down, they would fight off the invaders, they would save the day, and then they would just go right back up in the mountain. And he thought that was the perfect metaphor for Masaryk, because that's essentially what Masaryk did. He came down, he saved the Czech people, and then he just became president and just kept it going. Um, so again, as I said, Alvin was about five foot four, so you can see him working on Masaryk. It's um, with the plinth, it's 40 feet tall, and obviously it was much too large for him to do in his little Chicago studio. So he was working on it in the antiquities wing of the museum, and you can't really see it in the photo, but there was a walkway around the top of it, so people could look down and watch him work. And one guy decided one day to yell down, hey, Alvin, how are you going to get it out of here? And he said, I will ride it out. <laughs> That's not exactly what happened. Uh, it was cut into 23 pieces and sent to a foundry in Chicago. Now, this was 1941. 1940s, World War II, America's about to get involved. So a few pieces were cast. Alvin purchased all the bronze up front. He was ready. Well we get involved in World War II. So obviously, Masaryk is put on hold. Alvin, being the wonderful person that he was, donated all of the bronze to the war effort. So Masaryk basically sat in storage for several years, and then after the war, a lot of the foundries in Chicago never reopened. So he had to find somewhere else to have this done. So he sends it to New York. Well, New York does it, looks great, they load it on the truck, and as they're crossing the Queens Queensboro Bridge, the head of Masaryk hits the bridge and falls over. The only damage was a nick in the sculpture and a damaged fender on a guy's car. No one was injured. So of course, they pack it back up, they take it to the foundry, they try again later, and it goes smoothly. So eight years later, we have Alvin standing in front of Masaryk as it is finally being installed outside of the University of Chicago, where it still is today. Another piece that is very poignant, this is another favorite, Mother Crying Over the World. Again, this was done in 1942. Again, it was World War II. 
there were restrictions on metal, especially for artists. They weren't just going to give you bronze to go make a sculpture. They needed it for the war effort. Well, Albin created Mother Crying Over the World, and he had to fill out a special application and get special permission from the US government to be granted enough bronze to cast her. Because it features a female figure, you can see she's slumped over a globe. Um, it's hard to see in these photos, but you can see the tension in her muscles if you look at her in person. And she's hiding her face, she's obviously distraught, and it represents the grief of all the mothers, wives, sisters that were sending the men in their lives off to war and not knowing if they'd ever see them again. And the US government thought, this is just too perfect, and they gave him permission to cast it. A few years later, in 1949, Alvin decides, all right, it's time to retire. And he had made a friend. Her name was Ruth Sherwood. And she was down here caring for her mother. And Alvin had visited a few times. And he decided he liked Florida. He's going to move here. So 1949, he retires. He buys a big plot of land right up next to Lake Osceola in Winter Park. And he builds his home. Now, he's an artist. He's a sculptor. It was a studio with a bedroom. He essentially built a studio with like a kitchen and a bedroom, which is fine. Um, so he moves in January of 1950. He's all excited. May of that year, he has a stroke, and he is paralyzed on the entire left side of his body, and he was wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. However, he was still a jovial little man despite being in the wheelchair. Um, I, we have a photo from about 1950 of what the house originally looked like, different photo of what it looks like now. And if you look closely at the, or the older photo, you can see in what is the bedroom window on the first floor, you can see Albin sitting there smiling. He was so proud of his house. After the stroke, in comes Ruth Sherwood again. Now, Ruth was actually one of Albin's students. When he was working in New York, when he, it was announced that he would be the new head of the sculpture department, um, Ruth was heading to New York with her mom and her aunt and for a visit and thought, I'm going back to school for art. Let's go meet my new professor. So she showed up at his studio, and he was just so impressed by how excited she was, how sweet she was, um, that they became very good friends throughout his time at the Art Institute. She went on to teach there for 11 years. She was an accomplished sculptor in her own right. And she, like Albin, never married. Well, they reconnected, they stayed friends, and on December 14th, 1950, they finally married. Ruth was such an incredible person that she actually learned Czech so that she could write Albin's biography, and she learned Czech so that she could talk to his family and friends so that she could write it and get all the stories. Unfortunately, it was short-lived, and she passed away within two years of throat cancer, which she actually kind of tried to hide because he was paralyzed, and she didn't want to be a burden to him. But we have a photo of Ruth as a young woman, and then this one, they're both smiling on their wedding day with the nativity in the background and Victoria's Christ hanging above it. After Ruth passes away, of course, Albin is grieving. Um, but he meets some friends from Chicago who tell him, you know, you got to keep working. So he decides art therapy is the best thing. So with one hand, he, in 1957, sculpts Victory of Moral Law. This is one of his iconic post-stroke work. As I said, completely done with one hand. On the far side, we have the piece in clay before it was cast. Over here, this is what it looks like in bronze. The museum has one in aluminum as well, which is very pretty, it's very shiny. And in the center is a portrait, well, it's a photo of a portrait of Alvin with Victorious Christ done by his student, Michael Rahesia. He taught art classes while he was down here. Um, but in 1956 was the Hungarian Revolution, and Alvin, having lived in a country that was oppressed for most of its history, um, decided I'm going to create a political work about this. So the figure, the male figure on the horse is the United States. The
the horse represents democracy, and that serpent trying to encircle the world is communism. So it's the United States destroying communism. Another piece that was kind of a reoccurring theme, well, 14 pieces actually, were the 14 stations of the cross. You can see in the photos, there's some in bronze and there's some that look like they're drawn. So as part of his 40 pieces for St. Cecilia's Cathedral, Alvin created bronze medallions of the 14 stations of the cross. Well, when he retired to Florida, he decided to recast them using those same molds in fiberglass. Well, fiberglass doesn't really do well in Florida, sits outside, hurricanes, all that good stuff. So the museum, starting in the early 2000s, um, all the way up to last year, had all 14 recast in bronze so that they could stay on display and they would be durable enough to be there. Um, but part of his art therapy was this series of drawings. They were all done with colored pencil, Conte crayon, and charcoal. And um, they're essentially just the drawn versions of his medallions. So he would work on one really hard, finish it, and then he'd take a break for like a week or two, and then he'd go back, and then he'd take a break. Um, and in 1952, he built a chapel on the property because it was too hard to get him to and from church, so the priests would come to him. So he did these stations for his own devotional use, and they're still in the chapel today. But something fun about them, it's hard to see in these pictures, every time you see Mary, it's a portrait of his mother Petronella, and in station number 12, if you see them in person or if you find a picture that's not as small as this one, um, you can see Alvin is one of the mourners that's there. Say, it was essentially saying anyone can be devout, anyone is worthy. So the friends from Chicago turned out to be Dr. William Kubot and his wife Emily. And um, they connected, Emily was a bohemian, she also moved to Minnesota as a child, and um, they connected, they had moved to Florida, so they became very close friends, especially with Ruth's passing, Alvin kind of leaned on them, they helped him, and they were the ones that really pushed him to get back into creating art. So he marries Emily in 1961, after they bond over the loss of their spouses, and um, Albin essentially said to her, I'm sick, I need a carer, you're single, we should get married. So they did. Um, but you can see Michael Rahija did a gorgeous portrait of Emily, her glamour shot. And then um, we have a photo here of the two of them in the archway to the courtyard to the home. And um, Emily was actually a driving force. She was the reason with Palashik that the museum exists today. In 1961, they added on to the house because she needed entertainment space and couldn't just live in a studio. And they built the gallery, they started expanding, and they created the Alvin Palashik Foundation, which essentially solidified the museum. And she actually, it was in the contract that she would live in the house until she passed away, and then everything would be officially handed over to the foundation. So as a thank you and a wedding gift for all she had done, Alvin created a, por a portrait of her, and it's called the Emily Fountain. It's in the courtyard right out front of the museum. There's also one in Central Park in Winter Park. And um, it's her likeness, the face is her likeness. And reportedly when he gave it to her, he said, you will be playing the harp forever. And you can see him behind the, he's a little blurry because the water trickling down is the harp strings, so he's looking through that. Um, again, this was sculpted with one hand, and there's only a few of them that have been cast that are out there. But it was just an homage to her as a wedding gift, and it pretty much ended up being a thank you for everything that she pushed him to do. The final piece, this is his largest post-stroke work. Man Carving His Own Destiny comes back into the picture. Albin decides he's going to carve another one, and it's going to be massive, and it's going to be in his front yard. And he gets a block of Indiana limestone, realizes he needs some help. 
So he reaches out to Robert A. Bailey, who was an American sculptor who actually worked on Mount Rushmore, and he comes in to help Alvin create this. Now there is one difference to this man carving that you don't see in the other ones. Alvin never had to point a sculpture. Bailey had to point a sculpture. He couldn't just see something there and release it. So man carving his own Disney is pointed. If you get close to it, you can see the little pinprick marks on his legs. Um, but it doesn't matter, it's gorgeous. They actually built the scaffolding so that Alvin could get up there on his wheelchair and he could either hold the chisel and Bailey could hammer or vice versa. And I mean, that relation, the amount of trust in that relationship that they're not going to hit it too hard, they're not going to destroy it, um, is just remarkable. And we have a picture of Alvin standing next to it looking very excited. He was always happy. I don't think I've ever seen a sad picture of him. And finally, as I said, they created the museum. Albin wanted nothing more than to share his work with the world. He called his sculptures his children. He never had children of his own. Um, and when he passed away on May 19, 1965, the foundation protected everything, trying to keep everything intact. Um, Emily, as I said, continued to live on the property until she passed away in 1988. And today, the house is a museum, you can visit. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's one of 55 homes listed on the National Trust Historic Artists Homes and Studios. If you want to go visit Alvin, Emily, Dr. Cubot, and Ruth, they're all buried together in Palm Cemetery in Winter Park. They all, they moved Dr. Cubot, so they were all together. So yes, thank you for coming. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> Change the mold. Yes. How many mold? How many? How many copies of that does a clay modeling usually make? Usually, when the mold making process is taking place, they use rubber over the clay, and then it's fiberglass, and then the whole thing is dipped in sand and cast, and it's a long process. But the clay does not survive that mold. They actually have to scrape it out so that they get that negative mold. Any other questions? All right. In that case. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs>